Welcome back. As always, I am Coach Greg, and welcome to another edition of System Breakdowns. This time, we are going to be covering, by your request, the Count Michael Bisping, a Hall of Famer, one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. Excellent choice. I'm glad you guys voted for him. Speaking of which, make sure, go to the link in the description below and choose your favorite fighters, whoever you choose. When I go to pick the next fighter, whoever's at the top of the tally is who I pick. This time, you guys chose Michael Bisping. You guys get Michael Bisping. So I'm excited to break this guy down. Because Michael Bisping had some of the best fights of all time, really fought, man, some of the biggest names. Like, you talk about, like, I think sometimes the scale for whether or not somebody could fight in this newest era of MMA where guys are at the highest caliber is if you look at who they fought during their career. And, man, who fought tougher people than Michael Bisping? I mean, TRT, Vitor Belfort, Luke Rockhold, GSP, Anderson Silva, Chael Sonnen. Like, the guy fought absolute wrecking machines fight after fight after fight and you know win or lose this guy put on amazing fights every time so it was a great uh it was it was fun to go back through his very long fight history the guy has a ton of fights it was fun to go through all of his fights and watch them back uh, because they're so exciting so that being said stay tuned and let's start breaking down michael bisping okay so before we get started i'm gonna let you know I'm not hitting the bag too hard today with my arm because I have some ligament damage I'm trying to recover on, which means for six weeks, I'm not doing any sparring. I'm not doing any hard rolling, not holding mitts. So I'm trying to take it easy on my arm. So I will still try to give this with the same enthusiasm and hopefully moderate technique, okay? But mostly, I'm still using this mostly as a reference point anyway. I'm just not gonna be hitting terribly hard. So let's talk about Michael Bisping and what made him so successful. Range management, fainting, using the lead side to set up a more powerful rear side as he starts drawing them to the right. This is the majority of his game right there. From the outside, he always maintains just a kicking range. He doesn't stay on here where he'll be close enough to throw hands. Always just outside of it. Not far outside of it, just outside. So my reach is here. This is perfect. It's just enough to have a response time, right? Well, the added benefit of this is that now to get to me, they have to do an extraneous movement. That includes takedowns. For a guy like him, who is a dominant kickboxer, he wanted to force them into a kickboxing fight, especially against some of your wrestlers and stuff like that. He wanted to make it difficult to shoot on him. In other words, he wanted to have response time. If I can force this guy to shoot from a distance, it's much easier to defend than if I'm right on him throwing big combinations and he can shoot underneath. It's also part of the reason he didn't throw a lot of extended combinations. He would throw them sometimes, but most of his attacks were one-offs. Why? He'd get in here, throw a shot, and get back out. Always giving him a lot of response time, whether they were coming at him or uh, to shoot or to strike. Now, from there, he didn't force a range. He just followed them. If they moved back, he mirrored them and he moved forward, right? If they started pressuring him back, he moved, right? He drew them in to his counters. If you start backing them up behind the black line, get a shot and circle off, right? Get a shot and circle off. He'd go either direction because he was far enough outside. It didn't matter if he went to the power side, right? They're not gonna catch him anyway when they're outside of boxing range, right? When they're even outside of kicking range at that point. If he got moved back that far, he'd circle out. Then he'd recenter catch a shot, and then disconnect. That way, a lot of response time, but also keeping that range. And if guys wanted to pressure him, he was more than willing to let them walk into straight punching. So what happened to Chris Lee, just kept walking into his cross over and over and over again, right? So this way, a lot of response time for counters, a lot of ability to dictate the range so that he could hit them when they felt like they could not hit him because he'd use a little bit of a push step on it. We'll talk about that in a second. Actively fainting, we'll talk about that in a second. And just maintain this range so it's difficult for them to get to him, but he could always access them even when they felt like he, they, uh, he could not. Fainting, huge part of this game. A brilliant fainting practitioner. He does, so we talked about the channel before, the principle of fainting is whenever I'm not actively engaged with my opponent and I'm in range, I should be actively fainting. That doesn't mean like from out here, I don't need to be fainting out here, what's the point? But as soon as I move into a range, 
right? I should be actively fainting. And this is something that Michael Bisping was amazing at. He was very disciplined at always being an active fainter. Head movement, hip faints, hands, constantly fainting whenever he was in range. Disconnect, come back in, faint his way in, and attack. Very disciplined with it, very important part of the game. If you are not doing this yourself, strongly encourage you to make this a habit. Now, his range, talk about hitting them when they didn't feel like they could be hit. This is the nice thing about being just outside of punching range, right? I can't quite get to you here, even with a lean. Uh, so in order to get to you, all I have to do is push off. And this is what he did. And to add into that, he would add in a defensive gesture, mostly doing lead side hand techniques and lead side foot, dropping his head, right? Drop punching, very similar to what we talked about with George St. Pierre. As he comes in, drop punch jab. Starts putting these down the lane. Disconnect, faint, look for his moment, and get it. Then they start down in the front, lead side hook, drop in the head, disconnect. Now from here, you can start adding level changes. Right, fainting, they're thinking about the hands, principal projected intention, throws a leg kick, right? Comes in here, throws a leg kick, right? Comes in here, body kick, right? Then start adding level changes, occasional head kicks. He didn't throw them a lot, but in here, right? Pow. So I'm not terribly stretched out. Uh, coming in here, fainting, throwing this, throwing the body kick. And then he can start putting these together in combinations later on. He doesn't do a ton of combinations, especially not early on in the fight, until he starts getting some traction. But his goal is to hit a lot from the outside range. Lead side attacks allow you to do that without putting yourself in a ton of danger. Then, as he starts putting work on this side, they start cutting this direction, and that gives him his overhand, his crosses, things like that. So he starts putting it outside, faints his way in, throws jab, body kick, right? jab, hook. Then they start going this way, bam! And that's when he can catch him with the right, with his power as they're going in that direction anyway. So this worked as a really nice way to constantly stay on top of them. The body kicking and leg kicking work to drop the hands so he can put his jab on them. They start covering the front, he goes to the side, goes to the body, goes to the leg. He had his time from the outside to find the openings because he could strike quickly from just outside of range, but also maintain defensive distance with range management that gave him response time. So if they came at him, he disconnected. Come in, they come in, comes in, catch a shot because he sees the opening. Okay, disconnect, sees an opening, they're covering their head, I go to the body, right? It's just level changing off the lead side over and over and over again. Okay, let's talk about combos and counters. Um, most of his combinations, he didn't throw them a lot, and it was usually because they were getting too used to throwing a one-off and disconnecting. So when they get too used to that, he would change it off. Or he caught somebody and he wants to follow up on it. But most of his combinations are the same techniques he throws, mostly lead side techniques with the occasional cross and using these to punctuate off of each other. So you would see things like, you know, instead of throwing jab, body kick, hook, you'd see something like, pow, pow. Right? That leads that body kick, now he punctuates with the strength. That type of stuff works really well for his type of game. You see a lot of things like he'd throw the jab to set up the cross, right? Coming in here, right? Standard tactics. But then he punctuates without like it. Right? That type of stuff. He was very good at adding timing changes on his entries as well. So instead of going, pop, 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 pop. You hear the difference of it? Pop, 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 pop. Just enough of a difference to make guys start dropping their hands. Not pronounced, not pop, 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 pop. Just enough to make guys start to drop, right? Level changing to get them to drop their hands. Focusing on a lot of lead side attacks to turn them to set up big, powerful overhands. This is the type of stuff he would do very, very well. 
The other thing that he would throw on occasion that I really liked is his setup for the turning back kick. Sometimes he would try to come in as a knee strike. And as they back up, hit that left foot turning back kick. Once again, basically a lead side attack. Or do stuff like step into the turning back kick. It's a favorite of mine, old school Taekwondo, right here. A nice range technique when guys start backing off. Very, very effective techniques for this type of stuff. Uh, counters, once again, very simple. Most of his defense, like I said, was about dropping his head. He does the same thing in reverse. They come at him, he drops his head, and he puts a punch up. Usually a lead side, right? Usually he throws the left, the straight, or the hook. Every once in a while, like happened with Chris Lieben, as he comes in, pop, just starts putting crosses on him. Let's well, him block forward because Chris Lieben was just trying to tough his way in. And Michael Bisping's like, nope, not on my watch. So this is the majority of his game, right? Stay on the outside, pick him apart with one else fainting, right? Disconnect. Hook. Leg kick. Jab. Then you start putting it together. Back to it. That was his game. Rinse, wash, repeat. As they come forward, pop. That was his game. If they happen to start pressing back, he'd get his hands up on the inside to protect himself. And usually he'd use this to disconnect. That was basically it. Okay guys, so for this last part, I don't want to go into a long thing on the ground for him because there's not that much to go into. Most of it was kind of standard tactics. Uh, most of his takedown defense is about maintaining range to make it difficult for them to shoot on him. Um, if they did get him against the cage, you know, chin framing off, uh, under over reversals, normal stuff that you expect to see. Because he circled so much at the edges, it made it hard for them to pin him against the cage anyway. If it did get to the ground, most of the time, if they started to posture up to throw bombs, you know, putting feet on the hips to kick him off or getting butterfly hooks in there to kick him off, normal tactics that you see in MMA. But he does one thing I wanted to talk about here that I really like. When he had guys tight to him in a closed guard, what he would do is push, lift his hips in the air. Now I can't do it in this case because it's a dummy and not a person, so I can't push off of it very well. So I'm gonna put my feet on the ground to illustrate the point. He would lift his hips to create space and pull them down into the elbow and return back, right? In this case, he doesn't have to return his feet. So I'll just leave him here for this. Lift up, drop, pull down. Lift up, pop, pull down. This creates, I am in control of the space here, right? They're not in control of when this happens. So I get to determine how and when I pull them down into this elbow. Now that is nasty. If they start to posture up, I kick them off. But as long as I can keep them right here, all I have to do is lift my hips, bam! And that's gonna create my space, allowing me to throw that very nice elbow. Like I said, everything from there was pretty much standard part for the course stuff. If he did end up on top in a closed guard, he'd get to his base, posture up, throw some bombs, and then disconnect as needed, right? But that one thing in closed guard I saw, I really liked it. It's very similar to what we talked about in the Nate Diaz breakdown. We talked about the idea of getting to almost the scissor sweep kind of motion, getting this knee shield across, creating space to make it so that they can't punch you and pulling them in to throw my strikes, then pushing you out. Controlling this range. You can't hit me, I can hit you. If you start to hit back, I extend myself back out and now you can't hit me. I pull myself in to strike. I extend myself out so that you can't hit me. Range dominance, right? It's a really important aspect of striking from the ground. And if you can get good at this, man, it's, it really, you can mess people up. So anyway, thanks for watching. Make sure you share with your friends.